I have been playing through Days Gone for the last few weeks, and although it has been met with lukewarm to poor critical reviews, I have overall enjoyed my time with it. It also topped the UK charts for three weeks in a row, and passed the lifetime sales in Japan in two weeks of God of War, The Last Guardian, and Detroit Become Human in the same market. The game has its fair share of problems, and some are subjective, like the narrative, and some are more objective, like the constant frame drops. But I thought I would share some of the things that I like about it because it's been getting a bit of a hammering, and while I wouldn't recommend rushing out and buying at full price, it's definitely worth picking up on a sale. Also, the zombies are called freakers. Yay! Terminology. Cool. Okay, you know that. The first one is hordes. And let's be real, this is kind of the hook for the game. Since the gameplay trailer at E3 2016, the selling point for this game is the technology Bend Studios developed to allow hundreds of freakers to swarm after you. So many zombies that all fall over themselves, and just from the sheer number, you would need to run around and use the environment to slowly wear down their numbers. It's a cool concept, and it translates really nicely over to the game. The horde battles are some of the most exhilarating parts of the gameplay in Days Gone. You need to kit yourself out with tons of molotovs, explosives, and ammo. Then, if you are careful, you can explore the space and make an action plan about where you want to run to avoid the horde and lay out your traps. And finally, you can get their attention and run like crazy, turning to shoot and taking advantage of your plan. Or just winging it and doing your best to stay alive. It's a really good part of the game and it fulfills the promise we were shown almost three years ago in the gameplay trailer. The hordes pose a real threat due to their size and taking them on without preparing is usually gonna land you in hot water. So they also serve as nice things that you can G yourself up for or get caught out by if you aren't careful. Some hordes are placed near heavily designed spaces that have things for you to interact with like barrels and explosive cases. Some are just out in the open and you need to think on the fly. So there is even a little variety within the hordes. And when you finally shoot the last zombie and you get the horde killed screen or the mission progresses, you feel an overwhelming sense of relief, followed by sincere feelings of accomplishment. Oddly enough, Bend Studio only really makes them a significant part of the game about 85% of the way through though which is a bit weird considering it's the main mechanic that they advertised in their first gameplay trailer, so the pacing of the hordes is a bit weird. Feeling of progression. Another thing that is cool in this game is a constant sense of progression. This was pointed out by Skillup in his review of the game before I played it, and I completely agree now that I finished it. So a bit of background here, there is a few different scaling models that often get applied to games to make sure that they stay challenging but usually they involve the enemies that you are up against getting stronger as you get stronger. The idea is that the enemies will continue to offer a challenge and keep the game interesting. In Days Gone, you are largely up against the same enemies and in similar numbers for most of the game, with a few small introductions towards the end that mostly appear in missions. What this does to the gameplay is, it makes you weak as buggery in the early game, before you have unlocked better guns and crafting recipes and skills. This can be somewhat frustrating to begin with, but it motivates you to chase down upgrades so you can improve your character's abilities. As the game goes on, you unlock things that make the game a bit easier. You get access to new ways to approach problems and you unlock skills. Really just standard open world AAA design cookie cutter stuff here, but it makes you stronger. But the enemies, they stay the same. So each of these upgrades feels like a genuine step forward and you see the benefits of each progression almost immediately. At the start you have a pistol that sometimes takes 11 or more shots to kill someone. You have some fairly inaccurate primary weapons, and you have bugger all ammo for these guns. So you need to lean on the stealth mechanics and getting headshots to take on gameplay situations. In the mid game, you can buy a few sniper rifles and suppressors for them. Maybe you can repair your melee weapons instead of needing to find new ones. Your stats are a little higher. Things become a bit easier and you have more options at your disposal. In the late game, you have access to some of the best weapons, tons of ammo, all the toys. You can essentially charge into a camp and mow down your enemies. You can take on hordes, which until the mid to late game aren't a realistic ask for anyone other than the most skilled players, and your bike can actually take some damage and drive some distance without running out of fuel. So you get this constant sense of progression that is feeding back into the gameplay throughout the whole experience, which was a nice change to the usual AAA format. 
This leads me to my next one, the motorcycle. Now there is a lot to love here with your beast of burden, but you do need to put up with it at the start. The tuning of the fuel and damage meters in the beginning of the game will be a matter of taste, and how quickly you pick up the oversteer of the bike will determine how frustrated you are to begin with. You can't drive very far without needing fuel, and you can't take it off any sick jumps because it will fucking break on you. But once you nail down a few upgrades, it becomes a super fun part of the game. The bike is really fun to drive, and the map design means there's plenty of roads to max out the speed, and there's plenty of rough terrain to go off-road with it and have some fun. You can also drift the bike, which when combined with the similar sliding from the oversteer, actually makes the control quite elegant, with the few outliers where you slide into things or jump over something and lose traction and smash into something you can't turn away from. It's genuinely fun to just ignore the roads and the yellow line that tells you where to go and just make a beeline over land to the next quest marker. The bike has nitrous too, so you can get a boost, which regenerates, but we won't talk about that. And this is paired with a few parts of the open world where you need to jump the bike into a special location that you can't get to otherwise. It also helps with the bounty hunter missions, which are these bike chases where you need to shoot out the tires of another bike while riding yours. The bike is a really integral part of the game, and with the exception of right at the start, it is tuned in such a way that you have to take good care of it and always be conscious of how much fuel it has, and how far that will take you, and what state it's in. But for me, this made it so much more interesting as a gameplay element than the usual mount or vehicle you get in games like this that just carries you around the map. There are moments where you are running on fumes and you are hoping that the next location you have to go to will have some fuel somewhere so you can refill before you get stranded in the middle of nowhere. And you think you can make it like you're pretty sure, but you have to choose between playing it safe and refueling or risking the biscuit and going on to the next location. The next one might surprise you a bit. It's actually the day-night cycle. So this one might sound like an odd one, but I really thought the day-night cycle was a uniquely well-implemented part of the design of Days Gone. Many games these days have a day-night cycle as part of their design. It's one of those things that adds realism to the world and can be used for a bunch of things such as missions that make more sense to be set at night, but usually I find them to be essentially just a switch. You can just access different stuff at different times. The last game I played that had a cool twist to the day-night cycle is actually Final Fantasy XV. If you went out at night, you would get ambushed with fairly decent certainty by demons. Usually this meant losing access to your vehicle, so it wasn't a very good idea to go out at night until you were leveled enough to fight these demons. Gameplay effect. Risk rewards. Stranded boy band. Days Gorn's day-night cycle is similar, and it's great design. The super simple version of this is Zombies come out way more at night, and that means more problems to deal with. During the day, there are freakers out just sort of milling around making noises at things. Occasionally, maybe one will wander too close and you'll have to bonk it on the head with a bit of wood to get it off your case. But then you go back to what you were doing, killing cultists and whatnot. It's as close to safe and stable as you're going to get. When night rolls around though, the amount of freakers out on the prowl for a date with some fresh meat is something like five times higher. In comparison to day, they are all over the place. Now getting off your bike is likely to land you in the middle of three or four freakers, which is on the limit of what you can deal with without needing your guns. And if you fire your weapons unsuppressed, you are going to attract more company. Another thing that is triggered by the day-night cycle is the hordes. During the day, the hordes are in dark places like caves sleeping. At sunset, they make their way out of the caves and then each one has a routine they follow where they make their way across the land to a location where they hang out and feed and then make their way back to the cave at sunrise. This means if you are riding around at night or doing something nearby, you need to be careful not to attract attention from the hundreds of freakers sitting just over there. So doing things at night is much harder and requires more consideration. Stuff like more carefully approaching mission locations so the sound of your bike doesn't drag in a bunch of freakers. It has a gameplay effect and I like that. The next one is combat balance. This is something where I might be the only one that likes this, but the freakers can quickly overwhelm you. And while this happens less in the late game, it's still a real problem, particularly at night, when the problem can compound the more you run around and pull freakers. The best way to take out freakers is using a melee weapon. Guns work too, but the mechanics for shooting are a little bit janky and often it's a good idea to conserve ammo. Melee attacks take quite a bit of time to complete though, so from start to finish, if you are fighting more than two freakers, you need to engage in this dance of rolls and swings and positioning. 
If you get about six freakers chasing you, you pretty much have to resort to guns, which may attract even more attention, and you might be better off just bailing on your bike. I really like this idea because it means that you are always weighing up the danger of engaging with the freakers because if things go wrong, excess attention might bring down a crowd or deplete your resources as you swing and then repair your melee weapon. You have to kite the swarmers and slowly wear them down from about six upwards. The streaming gates. This is a game design channel after all, and let's be frank, these streaming gates are really cool. For those who don't know what a streaming gate is, Open world games are divided into chunks, and these chunks are loaded in as players need them. To avoid players seeing these chunks popping in and out of existence, the triggers for when to load these chunks are hidden in ways that integrate them into the game world and essentially hide the loading screen. Ever lifted a door by tapping a button? That was hiding a loading screen. Climbed under some rocks or threw a tight squeeze in between something? Pro prob probably hiding a loading screen. Here, where you can ride a motorcycle from one side of the map to the other, the loading gates need to be hidden where the bike can ride, so we have an assortment of high-walled areas of all kinds that really reduce down your vision so that the only thing you can see is the current streaming gate. The road is always blocked by something and Deacon needs to take a detour to pass it, but I like that there are quite a few different unique ones. There are quite a few tunnels with different arrangements of cars, which, let's be real, that's genius. Come on, that's genius. But also, there's this raider camp, this long gully, these weird volcanic rock formations, and this ripper pass. It just shows how inventive you can be with your loading. And the last one is the systemic moments of interplay between the game systems. This one is just a bit of fun, but when you sit back and let the systems of Days Gone all interact with each other, sometimes really special stuff happens. Every now and then a breaker will come and just smash up a bunch of swarmers because fuck those guys. I once had a breaker come over and attack me, so I dragged it through an ambush camp and it smacked up a bunch of the bandits in the camp for me. There's this little moment here where whatever type of cat this is was being harassed by freakers when it got a little surprise. Quite often you will see freakers chasing deer across the road. Freakers also feed on the dead bodies of things, so if you kill enemies, sometimes freakers will be attracted to their dead body and this can complicate or add an element to situations that you previously hadn't considered. It all just comes together to be something fun and enjoyable. And that's how I felt about Days Gone as a whole. It's not perfect, but overall it comes together nicely as a whole, and there's enough there for it to be fun and enjoyable. I think you should hit the bell so that you know when new videos are out. Subscribe if you want more game design videos, and thanks for watching.